Okay, uh, good evening everyone, and uh, I'll hand over to Sister Moira, who has uh, very kindly agreed to speak to us about St. Ignatius of Loyola and the spiritual exercises for which he is renowned. So thank you, Sister. Thank you, Bishop. Um, <clears throat> I was saying I better tell you why I'm doing this. Uh, since I'm not a Jesuit, you might say, what is she talking about Ignatius for? Well, um, he had a very big influence on the religious order to which I belong, Society of the Sacred Heart. Actually, when we were founded, there were no Jesuits anywhere except Russia, because they had been disbanded. And um, it was only after a good many years that they were allowed to begin again. The, a Catherine the Great of Russia would not allow them to be, to be taken out of her country. But for the rest of the world, they were um, not abolished. What's the word for it? Suppressed. Suppressed. They were suppressed. And then they came back again. So from then on, uh, they had quite a big influence on our founders. Not a unique influence, because like Ignatius, she had many, many interests. So that, that's one reason. And the second reason is that about, about 25 years ago, I did a year course on Ignatian spirituality and the giving of the exercises. And since then, I've been doing it. So that's, that's my credentials for being here. Right, so um, I thought begin by telling you something about Ignatius himself. You may know all this. And if there's anything you want to ask, please, please break in at any time. I would like it to be, you know, quite informal in that way. First of all, I'd say I don't think Ignatius would have recognized the term Ignatian spirituality. I think he, if he was here and he heard us saying it, he'd be uh, annoyed because he called the society the Society of Jesus, and Jesus was at the center and was at the center of all his thinking, praying, living. So he wouldn't have liked the word Ignatian. And then the word spirituality, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's a word that's come under fire recently. And I think he would have found it quite kind of bloodless and ethereal because his spirituality was very much of this world. God within all things. God in the whole of life and the whole of creation. So. In, in some ways, the term Ignatian spirituality is, is not terribly accurate. However, we, I think we know what we're talking about. We're talking about the legacy that he has handed down in the church of, of a way of following Christ true to the gospel. So he was born in 1491. I don't know if when you were at school, you learned a little, a little rhyme that I learned about Christopher Columbus. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? So it's easy to remember that in 1491, the Count of Loyola had a son. So <laughs> one year before, one year before. And so he came at the end of the medieval times and that influenced him very much. The age of chivalry, of the knights, of the knight errant, of riding out, you know, a, a, to follow your liege lord and to go on the crusades and all these kind of things. That was at one side of him. On the other side, there was the opening up of the new world. There was the change, changes in Europe, which, which were to lead to the enlightenment, the reformation, all kinds of things were going to change. So he stands there at the, at the cusp of the new age. Um, so in many respects, he was modern, although he writes almost like a medieval squire. He was modern in his mentality. And one of the, one of the ways he shows this is his great trust of experience. What we learn by our feelings, by our uh, daily tasks and work and all the rest of it. That, that was very modern and not exactly um, pleasing to the, the scripture people or the spiritual leaders of the time. Um, 
so that importance to, to feelings and to learn by experience. And another thing was his desire to see people come to true freedom. That people had to be truly free. That it must not be a, the, the mentality of a slave, but the mentality of someone whose heart is given to the thing. And so in the exercises, he's trying to bring people to that true freedom that, that he came to, to um, appreciate so deeply. Um, the early part of his life, he was far from a saint, very far from being a saint. And he, um, he went to a court where he learned more or less how to be a soldier, how to be the, the um, uh, squire who went out riding beside the, the Lord and all that. And then there came the moment of his conversion. And his conversion began when he was convalescing after a cannonball had shattered one leg and damaged the other. And he, he was about 30 at the time, and it was partly his own fault. He was the one who said at the siege of Pamplona that they should go ahead, although they were outnumbered, and so um, they were defeated. And the French were very chivalrous, and they had him taken in a litter back to Loyola, but his leg was shorter than the other leg. And he insisted that they break it, uh, it wasn't going to go through life limping, so they broke it and he, he went through agony and fevers and came near to death. And that experience changed his life. As I say, he was about 30 years old at the time. And by his own account, he was very arrogant, vain. He, it, it tells us that um, th um, he liked to wear his blonde hair in page boy style down to his shoulders, you know. So he was, he, his, his appearance meant an awful lot to him. Um, so he was vain, he was arrogant, he had committed sexual sins, he used violence, he was full of contradictions, and he had neglected the practice of his faith. So that was the, the person who was uh, knocked off his horse at Pamplona. On the other hand, um, in the illness, he desired to, to read and um, ask for books. And when they couldn't find any romances or novels or anything like that for him, they brought him the life of Christ and the life of the saints. And the saints were mainly Dominic and Francis. So he read those and he began to notice if he was daydreaming about becoming a great Knight errant or uh, pursuing some un unattainable lady or whatever he was, whatever daydreams he had about his future, he felt very empty and unhappy. Whereas, on the other hand, when he had read the life of Christ and then how Dominic and Francis had followed Christ, he felt totally different. He felt this is this is what I want to do. This is what life is about. And he felt a peace coming upon himself. So he began to notice this difference within him of the disturbing movements of his heart and the ones that were giving him peace. And out of that, he came to talk about consolation and desolation. When the Holy Spirit is, is attracting us to something or when a bad spirit is, you know, hounding us. <laughs> So he began to notice this very, very much during this, this illness and pain. And gradually, gradually, the desire grew really strong to serve Christ as his only Lord and to labor with him as the saints had done. And he had this great desire in him, but also very great blindness. He had a long, long way to go. So he began by stripping himself of his fine clothing. He was imitating Francis. No wonder Francis is imitating him. Uh, no, no wonder the Jesuit Pope is imitating Francis, because Ignatius did it first. Um, so he, he got rid of his fine clothing. He went out and lived like a beggar. And then he went to the monastery at Montserrat and had a very strong experience there of prayer. And then he went to a place called Manresa, where he stayed for most of a year. And the experience of Manresa transformed him. 
he admitted he was without any knowledge of the inward things of the spirit. And while he was there, he came to, came to face to face with his own evil within him, with, with all the, the wrong he had done. And he went through a period of great darkness, so dark that there were moments when he thought he would throw himself into a pit that happened to be quite handy. And he, he had to hold on, really, you know, by his toenails to faith in God because he felt he was beyond redemption. So he went through that very, very dark time. And during that time, he was suffered from scruples and he was doing terrible penances. And thank God he got good advisors and a good confessor who helped him to, or in fact, not just helped him, but told him to stop it. And when he stopped it, um, peace came. So um, after, after Manresa, uh, he had two very important contemplative experiences. One happened beside a river, the River Carbonet, and he couldn't describe accurately what happened. It wasn't really a vision, but it was a sense of the Trinity, of the triune God. And he said he learned more in the minutes of that than he did for the rest of his life, the sense of, of the Holy Trinity. He, he, he experienced Trinity like the three, three notes of a chord of music, but so much more than that. And um, so, Little by little, he began to go, come out of the darkness and into a new place of, of peace. So part of it was that he, up to that time, he had neglected himself. He was living in rags and dirt. <laughs> and after that, he washed, he cut his hair, he cut his nails, he stopped looking odd, and he realized that he had to relate to other people. And if you go around with you know, your nails dirty and your shoes, uh, down at heel, um, you, you put people off. So he began to look normal. Uh, and um, the thing was that he had met God in this world. He had met God whom you meet in other people. And he was seeing Christ in others. And he began to have that respect for others in Munal that he wanted to, to uh, talk with. So he began to offer the spiritual exercises to other people as a result of his own experience. And one of his, one of his um, strong points there was that whoever was offering the exercises must allow the creator to work with the creature and the creature to come to meet their creator. In other words, the person giving the exercise wasn't to get in the way. It was like an introduction, like, a, you know, sort of marriage introduction, you know, allow me to introduce you and then get out of the way. So that was, that was what he tried to do when he was giving the exercises to people. Um, the contemplating of Jesus and the gospel became central to the exercises to his life. And that, that wasn't original and not much in Ignatius is original. He was steeped in the traditions of the past. Um, as I said, he, he knew about Francis and admired him. He knew Dominic and admired him. And beyond that, he knew about the monastic tradition and often quoted. I remember reading the letters of St. Ignatius and getting stories about Benedict and um, Morris. Morris, Benedict's disciple, who being told to catch a lioness, caught one in front. <laughs> and also the, um, the Desert Fathers. All of these were part of his background. And he drew on them all. And so the Lexio Divina of the monastic tradition, he brought into the exercises. And the, the thing that he added to Lexio Divina, have you done something about Lexio Divina? Something, yeah. Well, you, you know that you, you ponder the passage, you mull over it, and you sit quiet in God's presence. And what he added to that was, what must I now do for the kingdom? And what am I going to do in my daily life, in my work, in my 
meeting others and so on. So he always saw that contemplation had to lead to action, to what I was going to do. Um, so he became what he called a contemplative in action. Um, so from, for, um, he, he noticed that a particular way of praying would open a person up to the action of God. So when he saw that someone was becoming more trustful, more patient, more loving, less rigid, less selfish, he was aware that they were praying the way God desired and praying from their heart. Whereas if, if that was not happening, if nothing was happening like that, he, he, would, he would try to help them to find the right way to pray. So in other words, when he saw the gifts and fruits of the Spirit at work in a human being, that was what he was aiming at in prayer. That those that in their daily living, their kindness, love, patience, um, compassion, and so on, would characterize them as being like Christ. So um, that, that was what he was aiming at. Um, in, in 1523, he thought he would set off for the Holy Land, and he had a great desire to live and work in the country that Jesus lived in. Uh, but when he arrived there, the Franciscans thought that he wasn't really a good influence <laughs> because he wanted to convert everybody, now, you know, Muslims and everybody else, in quite a you know anxious way that he would get them all Christians and so on. And also, he wasn't highly educated. He hadn't been educated for teaching. And they thought, mm, we don't need this guy around. So they politely told him that he should get in a boat and go home. So he realized that something had to be done, and he decided that he would um, ed educate himself. He would go to school. So here he is in his late 30s, and he goes to school, first of all in Alcala, and sits down with the boys and learns the basics. And then he goes to university in Spain, and then he realizes that to finish his studies, he'll have to go to Paris. So he arrives in Paris. Um, and he's, he's lame, he's in his 40s. And in Paris at that time, at the College of Montague, you would, could have found two people, both learning. One of them, a young man in his 20s, about 20. The other one, the lame Spaniard in his 40s. And that was Ignatius of Loyola and John Calvin. So you get the two, two, leaders of the refer the two leaders in the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation uh, studying in Paris at the same time. Both students in the same college. So um, Ignatius stayed seven years in Paris. And during that time, he gathered a circle of like-minded friends around him. And that was when he really, really got the exercises into shape. And, Real deep conversions happened among those students. And soon, quite a few of them wanted to follow Christ as he was and, and follow it in his way. And so you get the first companions. And that, that was the beginning of the Society of Jesus. And since then, the, the spirituality developed by Ignatius has been passed on by each generation of Jesuits, um, largely largely through the giving of the exercises, but also very much through work uh, in mission countries and work for justice and peace. So that, that's his life in a nutshell. And um, the exercises themselves, the, an outline, just a very brief outline of the spiritual exercises. And I'm going to give you a paper. Um, I'll just say one thing before I give you the paper. Um, the exercises, if you know anything about them, um, they're divided into four sections. They're called four weeks, but that's not a rigid week. It's not, you don't have to keep seven days or anything like that. Um, and as you can imagine, it's expensive to go to a retreat house for 30 days to, to make a, a full retreat like this. So nowadays, many, many people make it in daily life. 
to make the exercises in daily life. And that was something that Ignatius knew about and approved of. It's called the 19th annotation. That those are the spiritual exercises. And you don't put them into the hands of a retreatant because it would put them off. It's written in medieval Spanish. <laughs> but um, he has a lot of, of uh, amendments. And one of the amendments is that if a person could not go away from everything to a retreat house or place apart, then they could make it in their daily life and how that would be done. And since I came to Aberdeen um, 14 years ago, I would say about 20 people have made the exercises um, with me. And the very first one was a um, medical student at the university. That was the very first one to come. And since then, there's been quite a number of men and women, Catholics, Episcopalians, Church of Scotland, who have done it. So um, it's amazing how God sort of inspires people to want to do this. And um, it's, it's um, being done all over the world. You can actually do it online if you're clever enough to do that. So each week the, the retreatant is invited to become more fully aware of some aspect of God's call and begin to cooperate more and more with it. So I'm going to give you this paper um, you could look at, may I, I don't think I need all the papers. Uh, Right. If you turn to the one called the dynamic of the spiritual exercises, first of all, <clears throat> there is a movement, very much a movement in spiritual exercises. So I'll just go briefly through that um, page. Right at the beginning, and I'll say more about it in a moment. Right at the beginning, Ignatius has what's called the principle and foundation. Namely, the belief that I am created to love, reverence, and serve God so that all may come to fulfillment. So it's this very strong, positive outlook that I am loved, created in love by a loving God who created a loving world, you know. So that is his foundation. If I have that foundation, then I can go on Point one, to face the shadow, to face what is negative in the world and life, sin in all its facets, and come to a desire for conversion. But you can't face into the darkness unless you're rooted in love. And the third one, and in fact, if, if Ignatius found that that first foundation was lacking, he would keep people waiting. Uh, there was one famous Swiss a uh, young Jesuit, well, before he became a Jesuit, when he was a student. And I think Ignatius kept him two years at the foundation <laughs> because he had such a um, grim idea of God that he could not come to say, I believe in a loving God who loves all things. And, you know. um, so that, that was a sine qua non. Then the need to face the shadow. We have to, we all have to come to the foot of the cross. And then the close following of Jesus, time spent in Jesus' company, and that's where the, the public life of Jesus is very central to all the meditations, to come to that we may know him more clearly, love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly. And possibly commit myself totally to his kingdom. And then the third point, to be with Jesus in his passion and in his death and enter into his paschal mystery. So that, that would be a high point when it comes to that. And then the, the fourth point, united with the risen Christ, alive with his spirit, walking life's road with him, 
and at table with him in the Eucharist. And it closes with something corresponding to the principle and foundation, and that is what's called the contemplatio ad amorum, the contemplation to attain to divine love. When I see how God indwells all creatures, God is at work in all creation, God's gifts pouring down on me like rays from the sun, then, you know, I'm just awestruck. And that's when I say my prayer, take Lord, receive all my liberty. I'd like to end with that one when we come to it. Um, but just, just to give you an idea of all that's contained in the principle and foundation, if you turn over the page, this is just, this is just the introduction not going to go through the whole of the exercises with you, but just the introduction here. I'd like to say another word about. This is a modern version of it, written by Jerry Hughes. Have you heard of Jerry Hughes? Well, I think the best book on this kind of spirituality that I know, uh, for a starter, for a starter, is Jerry Hughes's book, *The God of Surprises*. And if you haven't read it, it's worth reading. I could even lend you a copy if you want. Um, so this is Jerry's take on what Ignatius says. Before the world was made, we were chosen to live in love in God's presence by praising, reverencing, and serving him in and through his creation. As everything on the face of the earth exists to help us to do this, we must appreciate and make use of everything that helps and rid ourselves of anything that is destructive to our living in love in his presence. Therefore, we must be so poised or so detached that we do not cling to any created thing as though it were our ultimate goal, but remain open to the possibility that love may demand of us poverty instead of riches, sickness rather than health, dishonor rather than honor, a short life rather than a long one, because God alone is our security, refuge, and strength. We can be so detached from any created thing only if we have a stronger attachment. Therefore, our one dominating desire and fundamental choice must be to live and love in his presence. Uh, just look at it again. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very profound, and we can't ex exploit all that's in it in one night, but just look again. Before the world was made, we were chosen to live in love in God's presence. Do you believe that? Before the world was made, you, whatever your names are, you were created, you were chosen. And you know, as I said, Ignatius doesn't um, invent much. He takes it all from the tradition of the church. And a long, long time before Ignatius, um, Augustine of Hippo said, quia amasti me, creasti me amabilis. Because you loved me, you created me lovable. And what's that for a thought, eh? Because you loved me, that came first. Then you created me, and you created me lovable because you are love. Um, so Ignatius is following in the tradition of the scriptures and the early fathers of the church when he says that. But how does it strike you? Does it give you a sense of how precious you are in the eyes of God? Or how much loved? Is it something you've thought about? Hmm? Not much. Well, it's awesome. Uh, so maybe it's something you might start to think about. Um, Anyway, uh, just to go back to the paper that I have here, um, if we leave, leave that aside for the moment, 
well, maybe a look at the other half, the other half of that paper uh, before doing that. Um, some of the aspects of Ignatian spirituality, which came out of his own experience, this fundamental importance of coming to a true image of God and a true image of self. And it's very interesting that John Calvin says the very same thing. He says, John Calvin says, it doesn't matter whether we begin with wanting to know God or begin by wanting to know who am I, we will come to the same thing. To, to know myself will take away all the dust and dirt from my image and I'll see myself as I truly am. And when I see myself as I truly am, I shall see the reflection of God. Um, or if I begin by seeking God, I will come to know who I am in the eyes of God. So this coming to the true image of God and of self is very, very central. Um, detachment. Do you remember he said, unless you have a greater attachment, a greater attraction, you can't give up lesser things. Take, for example, let's suppose some of you come from other countries. Uh, what, what country do you come from? Yeah, India. India. Right. Let's suppose that, um, that someone from India falls in love with somebody from Scotland. Right. Okay. What would make that person ready to leave their country and go and live in the country of the other one? Something what? Some, some kind of center or some. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. You don't know? Why? Uh, well, uh, the only word that comes into my mind is love. <laughs> I think. Yeah, love is an incentive, all right. So if, if you love, if, say, I. I love my home, I love my country, I love my job, I love all these things. But then I fall in love with an Indian, okay, that can all go. Do you see what I mean? If, if a greater love comes into your life, you can let go of the others. And that's, that's really what he's saying. So detachment from all that is not God. And then the need for discernment. And that's such a huge topic, I wouldn't even attempt to begin it tonight. That's something you have to do on its own. But it, it is to know by what spirit I'm being led. By what spirit am I being led? And here's a wee tiny thing that might help you with that. And that is that the Holy Spirit draws us, attracts us. And the spirit which is not of God drives us. There's a wonderful meditation in these, the, the um, spiritual exercises. It's called the, the two standards, where you have the evil one on a great throne high up, and he is uh, sending his minions out into the world to wreak destruction, and he's driving them out and he's bullying them all. And then you have Christ, and he's on a plane. He's on the level with everybody else and there's no throne around at all. And he is attracting followers who want to come and be with him. And then you're asked, where do you stand? <laughs> where do you stand? In which camp do you want to be? And it's a difference between being attracted and being driven. And that's just a good little thing to keep in mind. Um, and then the importance of openness to the word of God and to use the daily Lexio Divina as a way of listening, listening to God's word. God still speaks, and God speaks to us when we use his word. And then a growing awareness of our emo emotions, what he calls interior movements, the need to unite heart and head. And Ign Ignatius would say, be, be terribly aware of what you're feeling. You know, I'm feeling maybe angry. And then you say, well, that's my feeling. I have to admit it and say that's the truth of the matter. But then the second thing I've got to do is bring it to my head and say, yeah, but why? And what do I do about it? And I've got to use my will 
then to, to bring it to a right conclusion of what I should do with, it, with this. So you've got to have them all working together. And that union of heart and head was very important. And then the importance of the review of each day. You know, the, the Greeks say the unreflected life's not worth living. And Ignatius would say every day reflect, no matter how short a time, reflect on the day. And the kind of question to ask was, where did I meet God today? Where was God in my life today? Or what brought me joy today? What stands out for me at the end of the day? Or it could be, I am so sorry that I said what I said. How do I take that back? And then you put that into God's hands. So it's looking at the day and at what the Lord brings to your mind at the end of the day. Um, and then seven is prayer as intimate conversation with Jesus or with the Father or with the Holy Spirit or with Mary. And these are what he calls colloquies, where you just have a chat with whoever it is that you, you might be reading something about the life of Christ and you, you talk to him. Or it may be Mary you want to talk to, beginning of Advent, a good time to do that. Um, and then a growing ability to find God in all things, especially in all of creation, in the elements, in growing things, animals, above all our fellow human beings, men and women. And developing a contemplative outlook, that is an ability to see creation as a gift of God to be respected and cared for. So everything of life is, is leading me to God and speaking to me of God. And that, that's sort of ideal. Um, so is that enough? Have you had too much? Will I finish off the paper or will I not? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I was just going to say that there were three... Well, I don't have to go into detail now because we've done enough, I think. But keep in mind three key concepts. First, the principle and foundation. And you'll find many people traumatized by their experiences in life. And, you know, take, for example, that terrible uh, accident today, was it last night, in Glasgow, right. And there are people who will say, um, is it a good God? Could there be a good God? You know, my father was killed there and he was just out for an innocent evening, you know. Where, where, where was God? So you get people who have turned against God because of what's happened to them in life. Have you, thought, have you met that? Yeah. I remember when the accident of the plane came down in Lockerbie, um, there was a Presbyterian minister had been on the scene and someone said to him on the radio, um, I, where was your Christ at Lockerbie? Like that, very angry tone. And I remember him saying, I saw Christ at Lockerbie. I saw Christ in the paramedics going into that plane. I saw Christ in the firemen. I saw Christ comforting the survivors. Do you see two different views? One finding God and the other losing God, as it were. So the, the principle and foundation is the, the, the giving of that deep, deep rooted sense of God at work in, in everything. Um, a second one, as I mentioned before, is discernment. And he came to an appreciation of the importance of a life of discernment through his own experience during his illness. And noticing that um, when, when he thought of the things of God, it brought him joy and brought him peace. And that, that when he was thinking of his own aggrandizement and ambition, that it, it had a different effect on him. And he, he took into consideration his feelings very seriously. And the Inquisition didn't like that. I'm talking about feelings. Um, I don't know if you grew up that way. But in Scotland, it was quite common to say, feelings don't count. <laughs> Did you ever hear that? You use your head, you know? 
that was what you got brownie points for in a school, using your head. And he said, no, it's not enough to use your head. You've got to say what's going on at gut level too. And so that was, that was a, an important way of discerning what was happening. And um, modern writers on the subject stress that discernment is not an occasional act. It is a way of life, going through life, discerning as we, as we make decisions every day. You don't just do it once because you can't decide which, which subject to take at university and do it once in a lifetime. It's something that's part of life in ordinary decision making. And the, the last one is a very, very important one. It's the contemplatio ad amorum. The third aspect is it, well, in, in the course of his contemplation, Ignatius invites us to see God at work in all creation. And he says, reflect how God dwells in creatures, in the elements, in the plants, in the animals, and above all, in human beings, giving them understanding. And a few years ago, I had the privilege of being in Rome when a 30-day retreat was going on. And it was a Capuchin priest who came to say the Mass outdoors in the garden, beautiful garden. Uh, he had just been at the Rio summit on the, on the earth, you know, earth summit. And he was steeped in all this kind of thing. So the people making the retreat had come to this point of the contemplation. And he said, instead of a homily, I'd like to invite you to do something. Look at something in the garden around you and just focus in silence on that aspect of creation for three minutes. Uh, there were about um, 40 people present and I always remember what I looked at because it wasn't a bit romantic, I can assure you. It, it was one of these little, um, a, you know, like the, we, we call them slaters in Scotland. Do you know what a slater is? The, the, the wee bugs that crawl on the ground and it was down at my feet and I began to look at it and I'd never bothered about them before you know and the more I looked at it the more I wondered at it and I got totally taken up and I thought this, this thing could be prehistoric I mean it's, <laughs> it's actually got the form of a dinosaur this, this, this is an amazing and I was totally taken up by the amazement of this and there was absolute silence and stillness and much more than three minutes passed, absolute focusing. And, and then he, um, he said, you know, would you, would you like to say, he said, we don't normally go around looking at things properly at all. We hadn't been, you know, people were looking at much more attractive things than I was, you know, flowers and <laughs> clouds and things. But whatever they were looking at, just by focusing, they came to a new kind of wonder. My God, this is amazing, you know? Uh, but we go, we go through life without doing that. So um, he, he was very anxious that we, we would. And then that particular aspect of his spirituality it became very common among the Jesuits. And they began to study the earth and its creatures and so on. So it's not surprising that, for example, the, the Vatican astronomers, uh, do, you, do you get the tablet? Do you ever read the tablet? There's a, one of the, the Vatican astronomers writes at the back, Guy, what's his name? Uh, uh, Consul Manio. And he's a Jesuit and he works at the, 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 the Vatican um, observatory. Yeah, but um, as well as that, you get people like Teilhard de Chardin, and um, then a whole, a whole load of poets and hymn writers and so on, especially Jared Manley Hopkins. And, you know, there's a lovely one by Jared Manley Hopkins um, when he was in Scotland, and he, he wrote this, what would the world be once bereft of wet and of wildness? Let them be left. Oh, let them be left, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. So, a hundred years ago, Manley Hopkins was aware of the importance of conservation, <laughs> of ecology. He wouldn't have used those words, but he could see 
that the wildness and wet were part of God's plan for creation. And you get that um, sense of creation very much in, in um, T.R. de Chardin and many other of the, the writers. And it's part of the legacy from, from Ignatius. And then he, he finishes the exercises with the prayer, take Lord, receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my entire will, all that I have, all these things are thine, to thee I restore them. Give me only your grace and your love, that's enough for me. Now, not everybody's ready to say it, and you would never force anyone to say it, never. You can tell it to them, and if they want to say it, they can say it. Um, I thought we could finish by playing it. Is that all right? I'm not sure what to do with this. Um, if somebody could just switch it on, I think that's all that's needed to be done. Oh, lovely. Right. Okay. We'll make it a prayer. That's a taster session, <laughs> and you need 30 days to understand it properly. <laughs> or the 19th annotation, and people, you, you never push people in the 19th annotation. So people vary. Ideally, it should take about a year and goes with the liturgical year, but um, it doesn't always work out that way. And I can remember one man in particular who would always say, I need another week to that. I need another week to that. So the result was it took two years. And that was fine. That was where he was. So you see, you don't push. Where the creator is working with the creature, you stand back. It's a bit like being a midwife. You're not giving life. <laughs> you're, you're waiting for the, the life to come. <laughs> 